Today we're going to be talking about getting your group started. We've covered a lot of information so far as to maybe how to pick out your group, as to how to do different things, but what are the steps that you need to take to really get your group started? We're assuming here that you're here, that you want to eventually lead a group, you want to eventually be a facilitator, and how do you really put that all together? First thing we need to do is just think a little bit here. Okay, first, are you really called to do this? Before you get into this thing, it'd be good to decide whether this is what you're called to do. Secondly, what is the timing? Is this when you're supposed to be doing this? And then think it through. Is this what you want to do? Who are the people that are interested in your church or whatever organization you're going to do this in? What are the topics you're interested in? When will you begin? At some point, you've got to make up your mind and say, okay, I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to really do this. I'm not going to just sit in class. I'm not going to just learn this stuff. I'm really going to get started and actually go out and do it. Where will it be held? What kind of publicity am I going to put out there to try to draw people in? Will everyone in the group have a book? Will you expect them to do homework? Will you have sponsors? Or will you have prayer partners in your group? My wife leads a group and she always has prayer partners, people that they pray with in that particular group. What factors will make your group a success? And what factors will hinder your group from being successful? What pitfalls are you going to avoid? Hopefully you can learn by your experience in the group that we're doing here. You can learn by other stories that we tell you about other groups. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to do these same things again and again and make the same mistakes that maybe some of us have done. One of the things we highly recommend, of course, is that you get additional experience beyond the group that we have here, that you sit in some of our other actual support groups, and so you learn more by experience before you jump into this. Then we have planning. What are you going to do in the way of planning? These are things we've reviewed before, but you're going to have to decide and have concrete answers to before you get going. First one is, the truth or structure versus the process and experience. How much of your group is going to be drawing people out and getting them to talk and leading it that way and how much is going to be the teaching part of the group? How ordered is the group going to be in presenting the truth? Are we going to just have a manual and go through? I have a client right now, she was talking about one group that she doesn't really like, she has a hard time going to, because they're supposed to do the workbook at home, and when they get to the group, guess what the leader does? Have them read every line in the workbook. They go through the entire thing again. And the group sometimes takes four hours. Do you think that's a good idea? Well, she's struggling with wanting to go to this particular group. So you can have too much structure and not have the kind of thing that people really need that meets their needs. Growth as part of life grasped through the relationship. How much is it going to be relationship that people are getting, they're getting from each other, and how much is going to come from you, the leader? Newer groups and leaders will need more structure. Lower functioning level groups will need more structure. If you have, like another one of our counselors does, he does groups for persistently mentally ill people. How much structure do you think he needs in his group since most of them are borderline personality or bipolar people in his group? Quite a bit more structure, would you agree? Ministry of reconciliation must be included. How are you going to lead them to Christ? How are you going to help them repair their relationship with God because most of them are going to struggle with that. Your purpose will determine the type. Remember we spent a whole session just talking about all the different types recently? Well, understanding and applying the truth, that would be like a Bible study. Specific area of interest of growth would be a typical support group or a topical support group. 
healing a particular area would be a recovery group. And grow spiritually, emotionally, or personally is a growth group. What's going to be your flavor that you're going to have in your group? What is your calling and passion? Remember, we talked about that too. And how is this going to be a second family to the people that come? Those are all issues you're going to have to get a hold of. We need to also realize we need to choose our topics and our material. I mean, we spent a whole session now, and I went through a list of all these different good Christian materials that are available to you out there. Well, now is the time for you to finally choose, this is what I think I'm going to use, and what's going to be the basis of this? The need. It's always going to go back to the need, and is this, the people come first. The topics can change as the people change, necessarily. Broader is better, and the topic must fit with you and the members of the group. It must be biblical and sane. You know, you can grab certain books that I would never use for a group because there's enough stuff in that I don't agree with that I'm going to be just having to talk about, well, I don't really agree with that, don't agree with that, don't agree with that. But the majority of the ones that I gave you in our list are all ones that are very solid, very sane, very logically laid out. Have other people recommended this? Of course, we already gave you a recommended list. Are they created by people that know what they're talking about? Some books are written by authors that are going around just collecting material from other people. I don't recommend those. I recommend somebody that has either dealt with it themselves or somebody that is a counselor or somebody that is trained that has experience with real clients in that particular area. It has substance. It treats the members as adults. It's practical. And it fits with the nature of the group that you have there. You need to decide the frame. Research says that prepared group members have a better outcome. So what am I suggesting? You have a workbook type of thing. I would prefer, if I have a choice between a textbook and a workbook, I'll prefer the workbook because people can do it at home and they'll come prepared and you'll get a lot more out of the sessions instead of you having to teach and then they respond to your teaching. This is many times decided by the church. We started here on Thursday nights. The church decided they wanted to put all groups on Wednesday nights. So we got moved to Wednesday nights, which turned out good because that way they could provide child care. It's another thing you're going to have to decide, isn't it? Are you going to provide child care, which can be a real hassle. So if you can align it with your church some way that they already are providing Sunday school child care and so on, it's a lot better deal. And you need to communicate why those decisions were made to the group if the group isn't making those decisions themselves. Well, the facility we're using is only open on Wednesday nights. And that's why we're going to have our group on Wednesday night. Or it's only open on Saturday nights. Select members. Why? Remember that critical mass we talked about? You need those five people and those two leaders, and you need people that are going to actually show up. Can't just be, well, I think maybe I might come. You end up with two people. You need to recruit an assistant leader that's going to be stable and be there all the time. Friends, if you have to, get a bunch of your friends that you know and get them to commit to at least six months. That they'll be there, at least get this thing going for you before they go on to something else. Better yet, people that are really, really interested in what's going on. You can recruit from church members, of course. How are you going to advertise? That's something you're going to have to really decide. Are you going to use a recruitment seminar? We actually go out during the summers and we'll go to churches and we'll do a full seminar using PowerPoint and everything else, talking about support groups, talking about counseling. And then we'll say, how many people here? really feel you need a group like this, and how many feel you would like to be trained to be leaders? We get them to raise their hands, we have a meeting. In one particular church, we put together two support groups within one day. 
We came in the morning, did a presentation that night. We had a meeting and put them together. And we had some of our qualified leaders actually help them get started. And then they used our videotapes to train their people and so on to get two support groups going. But when you have that and you have the people right in hand and you have like five, ten people interested, it's a lot easier to get a group going, isn't it? Screening. What would be the one thing that why you might exclude some people from a group? Usually level of functioning. They're not really up to that. They really can't function at the level that this group is going to be at. Uh, knowledge could also be another reason that they're a brand new Christian and they don't know about you're going really deep into something. You want to have them have a, be probably part of a different group. And the group's purpose must fit the individual's need. I give you an example. We tried to get a divorce recovery support group going. It never got going. You know why? Because the people in the group really weren't in divorce recovery. They were all, uh, maybe divorce had been filed and they were struggling to restore their marriages. They weren't trying to really go through divorce recovery after the fact. So we really need to have a marriage restoration group, not a divorce recovery group, but the materials that were chosen were more for people after they had gone through a divorce in the year after or something. And so it didn't really fit the people in the group, so that group never gelled, and it never really came together and never worked. Now what I'm going to give you is sort of a checklist. And this is, what do you do at week one? And we're going to go through four weeks with suggesting this is a list of different things. It actually comes from Rafa, but it's a list of different things you want to do on week one, week two, week three, week four, to make sure you got everything taken care of and you have a little checklist here. Week one, meet with the pastor to make sure you have approval for your role and the pastor really wants this in their church. Identify the co-leader in five core group members. Determine the topic of the group. Determine the format. Is it going to be open and closed? That's really critical. Are you going to be going, okay, we'll do this for 12 weeks and we'll go into something else? Or is this going to be an ongoing group as long as people have the need? Determine when and where the group will meet. You're going to have to say, okay, pastor, what room can we actually use? Are there chairs in this room? Uh, what's the room like? A lot of our groups meet in daycare rooms and we have to move materials because they're all really set up for daycare. Determine the budget or assistance to be provided. They might say nothing, or they might provide you your books. They might provide you advertising amounts of money and different things like that. Develop a strategy to publicize your group. What are some places you can publicize at? Newspapers, secular, local, Christian newspapers. Self-help network is available here, which lists all the support groups in Kansas. You can get outside people from that because they can just go on the internet now and they can just look for any group of any topic that they're looking for. Grocery stores, libraries, many times have places you can put material. Radio stations, many times will give you free announcements just so you're not charging anything for your group. Door-to-door -door flyers or mail in the local area. If you have enough people interested, you can go and put a flyer in everybody's door around where your church is. Focus on the type of your group, the locations that will count. Sometimes you can put them at courthouses. If it's like a DUI, family preservation, other places that are going to have those needs. Sometimes even with the judges in the courts will allow you to put flyers there about that particular group. See, if you were doing divorce recovery, you might be able to get a situation where people have to come to file their divorces that you have your material there. Other local self-help facilities or counseling centers. Counselors are usually looking for support groups to uh, go beyond what they're doing in a more long-term situation. Make a support alliance with other groups or organizations of similar interest. Other churches that have the same support groups, they might have some people that they're closer to where you are. And your church billboard. 
Most churches have a billboard out there, and have you ever gone by a church and you saw it said drug alcohol group meeting Wednesday night or something like that? Yeah. Order your materials on plenty of times. So you have them when you start. Make or print group flyers, brochures, three by five cards, cards to have others put up. Send letters to the radio stations. This is all in the first week. Ads, get them all set up and get them out there so they're going to happen on time. Give out your flyers. Get your friends to help you give out your flyers. Prepare and train your facilitators as needed. Hopefully you already started that because if you're using our program, we go 10 weeks, don't we? So you better start 10 weeks before of getting your facilitators already trained. Week two, publicizing the group checklist. Announce in the church bulletin. A brief announcement during the service, testimonies, or have people sign up. Probably all three. One of the best things you can do is take several people, if you've had this group before, to stand up and say, this is what I got out of the group. is the most fantastic thing I've ever done. It's changed my life tremendously. And that'll help you recruit a lot of people. You can even have an orientation meeting. I know several groups that they'll have an orientation meeting beforehand uh, to see how many people are interested to actually form the group. Better yet, if your pastor is really supporting this, he can do a sermon on it. Or your pastor at least can talk about the small group ministry in the church. Ensure the previous publicity is operating. Don't think that just because you send something out, it's really going to happen. You probably have to email them again to say, did you get that started? Or when's it going to be on? Can I listen to the ad? Other things like that. Week three. Contacting interested individuals. Because you have these people, maybe they thought about it, but now it's a couple weeks later and something has come up. You want to make sure your core group is lined up and they're really ready for this. Contact the individuals who responded in person or by phone, never by mail. How much stuff do you get in the mail? And how much stuff do you trash? Maybe not even looking at it. You want a personal contact. Make a list of those qualified to help with leadership, sponsorship, core group. Make sure they have significant recovery. You have to decide by this point, are you going to use sponsors? AA normally has sponsors. What does that mean? You're going to have some people in this group that have experience. They have a reasonable amount of sobriety or one in this battle who can take other people one-on-one -on -one and sort of mentor the other people in your group. Determine if anyone needs child care and get arrangements for child care, babysitting, whatever you have to do. Sometimes you're going to have to ask people that have children to pay a little bit so you can hire a teenager to actually do this. Preferably, though, put it on a night when your church already has child care provided. Visit the location. Plan the signs, the chairs, the access, the heating, and the cooling. How is it going to be if you arrive and you're all standing at the door and you forgot to get the key and so you can't even get in? Is that going to go over well? They're going to see how organized you are and that first time is going to sort of make or break you and get this thing going or it's going to be, well, this isn't really anything and it's going to drop out. Prepare yourself for the first meeting. Week four. Arrive early and arrange access, seating, temperature, lighting, put up the signs, pray. If you're going to have a particular room and people come to the center, middle of the church through the main doors, have a sign there. Have signs throughout the church, leading them until they get to the room they're supposed to be going to. Pray. Because if God is not involved in this, as we said before, you're going to get what you can do. But if this is God's thing, you're going to get what God can do. View the initial attendees as your core group an opportunity to learn and make adjustments. Don't have this in concrete. When you, once you meet that group, you can ask questions. You can see where they're coming from. Go around and break the ice and say, you know, what, what do you hope to get out of this group? And if the group isn't aligned to the people, guess what you need to do? 
realign the groups so that this is the groups thing and it's aligned to the people that you're really dealing with. Introduce yourself and your background and qualifications to lead the group. Share your burden, previous experience, and success in previous groups attended. Then introduce the material, give a global view of the problem and the goal. It'd be good to have some statistics to be able to say, this is where things currently are. That's why we're trying to work with this. How about some good stories of other people that have been in a group like this who have recovered that got significant things out of it? So they have hope that this is really going to have an effect on them. Try to get them committed as the core by getting their input and ideas. You know, would you guys be willing to commit to come to at least six months and give this really a try? Delegate when confident of individuals who will be faithful that maybe they will be your sponsors or they'll be your assistants or maybe they will even come and set the chairs up for you or help you put out more flyers to advertise. Get them to share about why they came and their expectation and their hopes. Obtain and get permission to publish the names and phone numbers if that's what the group wants to do so they can all call each other. Assign sponsors. If you have faithful, experienced people, give out their phone numbers so people have a sponsor, somebody to call if they're struggling, somebody to talk to. If you don't, what do you need to do? You're going to be the sponsor for everybody. You're going to take a lot of phone calls until you can raise up some more people in this group to be able to help the other people in the group. We really, though, want that synergism. We want them all talking, working together, all buying into this group. Give out or have them purchase the materials. Big hint. Don't give out these materials cost you something and you sort of just hand them out to everybody and don't pick them back up and say, well, pay me when you can, what is probably going to happen. You're not going to get paid or some people are going to forget or some people are going to drop out. You're going to lose the book. What we'll actually do is that we'll hand out the books, let them use them, but say don't write in these until you actually buy them and then you can take them home. So what do you think? Put yourself in that picture. Picture yourself there actually doing this. Is it a little bit scary? It probably is a little bit. You're probably going to have a little bit of anxiety. But you'll find it goes a lot easier and a lot better than maybe you ever thought it would go. What do we offer? Well, one, if you're actually doing this and you actually get started, we're available to consult with. Call up, well, first group, this, is a, this didn't go exactly right. What do I do now? That's why we're here, is to help you in that particular thing. We'll look over your plan before you get started and say, well, have you thought about advertising this way and this way and this way? We recommend just like starting a business, you have a business plan, you have a plan. Remember that was one of your assignments in this class? Is you were to write up a proposal to your pastor about how you would do this and the things that you would do. And you need a plan and we'll look at that plan and maybe give you ideas. We're willing to meet with your pastor to discuss support groups. Many times pastors are afraid of liability issues and we can help them understand that there's very little liability if you're just a self-help group. Free training on the internet for your assistant leaders, for others. If you're close enough, we'll do a recruitment seminar for you. Come in and try and regroup, get those people together. We'll send experienced people if we have them available to actually sit in in your group, maybe help you get started so you have some of the experience the first couple times that you get started until you can take it over. We've got forms available for rules, other things like that. They're available to you if you want them. And of course, if you have problems, we'll be on the phone, we'll be willing to talk to you. Of course, you can come to supervision also and we'll help you that way. We're here to make this work out for you and we're here to pray for you. So what we're saying is you're not alone. That's the advantage of taking a class like this. If you want to get something going, I suggest this is a time to start thinking about it. We only have about four more classes in this course. And this is a time to start thinking. Are you really going to do it? 
Are you really going to start something because until you really get the experience? I highly recommend that in our group that we have here, you actually do volunteer one of these last times and you actually get some leading experience. And then after that, you go to some of our other groups and sit in on the groups so you have some confidence when you go out there and you get started. It's always nice to get trained in something, but until you go out and really do it, that's what we found in the whole area of counseling. We can give you all this information, you can take all these courses, but until you go out and you really do it, you don't really have it. AA has a saying, you don't really have it until you can give it away. Until you can teach others, until you can really lead a group, until you can really work with people in a group, and you've had that experience, you really don't have what we're trying to give you in this course. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are our God and that you have the answers and that you'll be with us in whatever we do. And I ask, Lord, you'd make it clear to the people of this class, Lord, that they would go out and carry out your perfect will and they would have the confidence that you will provide all sufficiency in all things that they may abound unto every good work. And Lord, we give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. So I guess the question is, um, what happens when you pray? So let me ask you this question. If, 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 you, if any of you had the experience where you prayed for something pretty fervently, wanted it, knew that it's pretty much what you felt God wanted, and so you prayed for it, and then something else happened. So, and then we'll talk about that.
can we be sure? It is not God who will truly have the peace about it. Because it's like if we if we keep pursuing, it's like if if we don't have a true peace about it, there will be a catch in our spirit, and all of a sudden we were we were, we started to pray for it, and all of a sudden this like catch you don't even have any, any words to say about it whatsoever. It's like if you've got a peace about it, it'll, it'll just be natural. It'll be something that's like it just flows out of you like you know, like living water or whatnot. So it's like. God gives you the energy to uh, to pursue what He what is truly from Him. If it's not from Him, you won't be able to. Oh. So what I'm hearing you say is that there's a peace that, that you get that comes from nowhere else. I mean, you know that peace is from Him. Is that what, what you feel? Well, I find that, you know, normally I would die on the phone to my daughter and probably, you know, who had a lot of negative things about it. He caught me in the right time. <laughs> you know, because basically, I don't think that's a good thing, but, but it's not me that has to decide it's God. And for me, I can lay down that night and just go to rest. Because it's whatever, you know, I believe God has purpose for each one of us. And it may not be His purpose to live closer, you know, to me, you know. Um, his company was laying off people, you know, and I had hoped, and he had hoped, that he would get laid off. But instead, <laughs> you know, because then he thought, oh, I can, I can take that bonus money and move home. But obviously, you know, he, had, he, was, he was one of the fortunate ones that still got to stay on uh, with the, the bank. And uh, so I think that God, you know, just works it all around, and we just have to move in that direction. You have to make your necessary adjustments. And, and move with him and not work against him. Yeah. Better to be employed than not. Right. Meaning everything I want isn't what God wants. <laughs> I remember okay. as, a, as a kid, you know, you, you know how kids are. You know, <coughs> I wanted a spicer. And we lived in this little town. And so I went to the catalog and picked up my bicycle. And what do you think I'm trying? Bring the bicycle real fast. And within a week, you know, I'm hoping one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, six weeks before my bicycle came. <laughs> Was that guy not answering prayer? Or what is that? God's timing. This is how it was. Yeah. What I found, what I learned the hard way is that. I need to really find out what the will of God is before I start praying for it. Because otherwise I'm going to have these situations where I have my idea and I'm going to be praying and I'm going to feel that God didn't come through for me, but it was never God's idea. I like to say God is playing the six billion dimension chess game in which all the players move whenever they want to. And I have to decide, am I capable of playing that same game? Do I really know everything of how this is going to turn out? See, do we even know uh, if your son moved here, would you still want your son to move here as an example if you knew he was going to be killed in a car wreck as he came? Probably not. And so we have all these things that we don't have enough information to know what is truly good for us and what is truly evil for us and therefore, it's a struggle of the balance in my life anyway between trying to really hear from God and know that this is God's will and I'm praying for it and my ideas of how this thing is supposed to turn out. And I have to watch it. I don't get in the way of what the true reality and the true good for everybody involved is versus what I would like. I guess I figured out that I'm not as smart as God. I guess that's my problem. <laughs> Which kind of takes us, comes on. We, yeah, I think sometimes God, sometimes different things happen because even sometimes when you're praying for something, it may be God's will, but you're not ready for it. Like, like you know, I can pray, I'll, you know, I want to be a pastor, give me a minister, you know. Well, God's not just going to slap me in Pastor Rob's position. You know, without, you know, he may say, well, here, teach this Bible class for a while first, or go work in the youth, or, 
you know, just because I didn't automatically get elevated to senior pastor doesn't mean that God's not answering my prayer and letting me start a church. It says that, you know, realistically, a 21-year-old kid, you know, is not going to be effective comparing, you know, compared to someone like Pastor Rob with that much experience. So God is going to, is God will answer my prayer, but he's going to make sure I'm ready to have it first because he's not going to put me there and then, you know, throw me to the wolves and then have me turn bitter and, you know, so he's, he's really protected me then by not giving me exactly what I want right in there. He wants my character to be prepared for it before I can do and get what I pray for. Exactly. And, and sometimes I think when we have to wait on God, when we have to wait for our answer, it's an opportunity for spiritual growth and to let us see like where we're at with Him. Like how much are we willing to depend on Him? Because that's because it's so easy to just throw in the towel and not keep praying, like she said, and then keep praying for it. Because once you see it not coming, not coming, and you're like, well, I guess God's just not going to do that, and i got to move on to something else. But if we're really in line and we're supposed to be with Him, and if we're like higher up in the spiritual growth, then we're going to be able to have that endurance. And so it, it just gives you a, a checkpoint to see where are you at with Him. Which takes us to the next point. Excellent. What do we do when God's silent? Has He ever been silent? When you pray for something, have you ever gone through a period where you pray and nothing? I know. I might <laughs> yeah. I, I think so, uh, sometimes, too, God gives you something to do, and He's not going to give you something else until you're finished what He gave you to do in the first place. So sometimes you get impatient, you start saying, oh, I'm ready to move on, I'm ready to move on get something else, something bigger, better. And he's saying, no, finish what I gave you first. So he's not going to say anything because you already know. He already told you. He's not going to repeat himself. And you just got to come to terms with that and finish what you're supposed to be doing. And then God will move in and tell you something new, what he wants you to do next. But he's not going to give you five steps at once. He's going to say, let's do this first step. And he's not going to give you the second step until you're done with that first one. So, can, can you just think of a, of a time in the Bible and maybe a personal time when God was silent with you? And what happened? Right now I'm paying for a job <laughs> and it seems like I'm getting nowhere. I don't even have a clue what to do. What You know, I'm just applying for everything all across the board. Anything that I can think that I might even mildly be interested or mildly good at and it seems like I'm getting nowhere with it and I keep asking God, where's the job? What am I supposed to apply for? What am I supposed to be looking for? And I'm getting nowhere. <laughs> it seems like and like I'm not getting any answers back from him. So one conclusion you could draw from that is he's not interested, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we know that's right. Yeah. <laughs> there is a purpose <laughs> for the silence. And I think that's what the book but what I got from him this week was, you know, his timing is exquisite. Yeah. And usually it means that he is preparing something really, really good for yeah. you. And that's what I'm learning and learning to depend on is that, okay, just because they're not getting it now doesn't mean it's not coming. Right. And like my fiance was looking for a job and he's been looking for probably four months, like for a new job. and. Everybody's been pressuring, why don't you have a new job yet? Why don't you have a job? And I was able to believe it for him, but I'm struggling with myself. That, well, it's just in God's time. It's coming. The right job hasn't opened up yet, maybe. Or, you know. And then there it was, like, last week he started his new job. And so, I'm just waiting for him. <laughs> so, silence can be something that we can uh, trust. That God uh, is getting ready to move us to the next step. Uh, so can anybody else think of a personal time? I can remember a personal time when I had. I was working, I just got this job, it was a really great job. I had it about six, eight weeks. And the guy fired me. And I went, what? It was like, I was out of the blue when I started doing a good job. For some reason, I wasn't, or he 
you didn't like me or something, I had no idea. I never had that happen to me in my life. And I just went home and couldn't believe it. And I hit the streets and, uh, you know, just started going to the end of my rope. And out of the blue came this job that I didn't even apply for. It was like, came to me. And it was the job that was prepared for me because it was things I would never have dreamed that I'm doing now. And I just didn't have any, any idea, but God was preparing that job while I was having this job for the six, eight weeks. And after it was all done, it was a lot of misery and heart and suffering and everything went through. But after it was over, I looked back and said, wow, okay, that was happening. You know, the silence was there, but then in the end, it was moved on all about So, go ahead. And I think, and with me, it's like, and this is something I've been learning a lot in friendships, is because I've always been raised with friendships that the way you, the way you build friendships is through spending time with each other, how you spend time with each other through actually communicating and stuff. But God's been showing me even late, even lately, even silence can even be a, be a way of growing a friendship too. It's like, uh, I've been asking God all week, how does that make sense? This does not make sense. And, uh, and he's, been, he's been showing me that, hey, even, even silence and friendships can build, build friendships. I'm gonna show you, and he's been showing me different ways how. It's like, even, even in that, it also, for me, it's, it's helped me that, it's helped me that to honor this person, it's helped me to, you know, to, learn to back off, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, so it's like, so in different ways, even, you know, even when God, even when things seem silent within friendships and stuff, that's God's way of saying, okay, I can still teach you all these kind of things, your friendship is still going to grow, because I'm growing it, not you, and that's a, that's a big thing that I've had to learn a lot lately. <laughs> oh, yeah, along with that, yeah, I mean, you know, there's the verse that, you know, be still and know that I'm the Lord, you know, and uh, I find that you can really tell when I'm clicking with someone if we can sit in a room in silence and not say anything and have it not be awkward. Yeah. Like, I just know how that's how I know, you know, really. And uh, I think God waits for us to do that too, you know, just sit there silently still and know he's, he, he is God and wait for him. And also, Think that sometimes he's silent because we ask him for help, but we're not, we don't want to give up the control. We're still trying to do it on our own. We're asking for the help, but we're not really expecting it. And so God will just stand in the side and not say anything and just let you run into the wall a few times until you're willing to stop <laughs> and say, be still and, and let him do what he wants to do. But he's not going to force himself into it. So you know, he, he, he will stand aside and not say anything and just let you try and be your own God until you realize that you can. You know, so, yeah. I think a lot of times silence is a way to get you to trust him more. Um, she had a cardiologist appointment yesterday. And I, the days before, I was real anxious about it, you know, thinking, what if it's her heart that's causing the low heart rate? And, you know, praying, please give me peace. And, you know, it was my anxiety, and it just didn't seem like he was answering me. And it took me a lot, and then finally, about the night before, I realized, I just need to trust <laughs> that it's going to be okay. And sure enough, I walked in yesterday, and it was fine. And it was kind of weird when I walked in, because normally, I'm the type of paranoid mother, I would have been, you know, panicking <laughs> and, you know, real worried. And I walked in with a great deal of peace yesterday mm -hmm. morning that no matter what was going to happen, that it was going to be okay. But those days before, I was praying for peace and it just didn't seem to come. And it just didn't matter. I had to step back and say, okay, she's yours. I trust you. And so I think sometimes it's just a matter of trying to keep your trust more. And that's why he's silent. So what I'm hearing you say, and happens to all of us, is that life presents circumstances to us. In your case, mm -hmm. to each other that you're talking about. All of us have some circumstance which was thrust upon us to no nothing we did to make this happen. It just happened to us. And we're in the middle of it. 
and there's suffering going on. And we are wringing our hands because it's, we can't change it. And so um, the, the book talks about that a little bit. It talks about uh, if we're in the midst of a life circumstance like that, to do what you did. And that is to reach out and ask him for his perspective. Because like Dr. Reiner said, he, he sees the picture which we don't see. And so we, it, you know, what do you think about that? Here, here's the concept that I was blown away with that I never considered. Went in this book and it says, truth is a person. That's an odd thing to say, don't you think? Truth is a person, not a concept. And I thought about that. So what do you think about that? Truth is a person, what does that mean? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> It's a vital question. It's vital to us personally. One thing, I had a sermon one time, and the sermon was, God only gives hints. And what they're saying is, why is it that God just doesn't appear every time we ask Him, and just show up, you know, here He's standing right in our midst talking to us, why does not He only, why does he only give hints? And the reason is because he wants a relationship with us. It is that relationship with Him that is really the critical thing for us to feel uh, that everything's okay. And so that relationship, and, and by only giving us hints, He wants to be our uh, tour guide instead of our map. He hasn't given me a map for the rest of my life. I don't know what my problem is, but He just hasn't done that. And he wants us to have that relationship. And I think that's what you're referring to, is that uh, truth is knowing him personally. He has the truth. He is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. And that's what uh, this is really all about, is having him as your best friend, as your guide, as the one to take you through life. And what he says and what he is, that's the truth. Yeah. Following up on that, a relationship. And the other thing that blew me away in this reading was prayer is a relationship with a real person. Remember reading that? Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? I, I went, whoa, where'd that come from? And that's interesting because it goes right back to what he was just saying and what you said. It sounds like what happened to you was in the midst of worry, you reached out and you asked, you know, you ask for his perspective, you ask for something from him. And it sounds like he gave it to you. Yeah, I was, when I look back at it, I was probably asking for peace for my worry, not so much. And he wanted me to turn her over to him and just trust him instead of keeping her to, you know, to myself and counting on myself and the doctors and everything to be okay. I was asking for peace in that situation, whereas he was wanting me to just say, Okay, I trust you. She's yours. And I think that's what brought me the peace is I finally just said, okay, <laughs> you know, I, and gave her to him. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the circumstance changes. I mean, it could. It could change for all of us. If we pray, because what do we pray for normally? Change circumstances normally. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't happen, which a lot of times it doesn't. Can, can we come back to that same circumstance on a different level like you did? With peace where the pain of that circumstance is no longer there. Is that possible? I think it is. I think that's what it means by refining of our faith. The, 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 uh, we, we have pain because we believe something about the circumstance and it may have nothing to do with the circumstance. And so the refining of her faith, I think, at least my perspective on it, is that um, we get the peace that you talk about, we come back to circumstance, and the circumstance is still there, but it's no longer painful to us. And, and we've grown a little bit in our faith. Like in her case, you know, she still has a heart, abnormal heart valve. It could get worse, yeah. but it's very rare. And unlike in the past, I know I would worry for the next six months until we started the 
saw the cardiologist. And I'm not. I'm just very peaceful about it. And so it's like that initial getting that peace is going to carry me through the next six months, so I'm not worried about it. And I just, I feel okay with it. And I know no matter what happens, if we go back in six months and it's worse, you know, I trust the doctors and everybody will be led to do what they need to do, which will be just fine. And so it was almost like I needed that peace in order to get through the next six months, and he knew that. <laughs> so he wanted me to find it before I went to the appointment in that way. Hanging on to that thought, uh, all of us, and if the book talks about spiritual markers, do, do you guys remember how you responded to that? Spiritual marker, uh, something that happened in the history of our lives where we uh, had an encounter with God and we came away with it better and we remember that. And so the spiritual marker uh, is something that we go back to in times when that are tough to try to determine what is God's will. Well, how did he deal with me in the past? So I go back to that spiritual marker milestone. So uh, do you guys remember any spiritual markers in your lives? Or what do you think of the concept of spiritual markers? I mean, that, that's like a, a practical way of dealing with trying to find out what is it that God is wanting here. I think, <clears throat> and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are a lot of times you know, like, I want my son to be home, but God's saying, if I, you know, when, when your husband died, you lean on me. So if he comes home, are you really going to lean on me or are you going to lean on me? So that marker is, you know, I have to, you know, God knows best. You know, He knows where I'm at and where I am. But you remember so, when your husband died that you were able to, yeah. that's a marker for you. And in your case, you know, you can go back to what you just said about the peace that you feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which came from outside of you, somewhere. <laughs> and now you, now you feel this peace. <laughs> which you can now remember when circumstances happen. Uh, anybody else got a spiritual marker? Want to talk about? I have one. Yes. Um, I have been a real spiritually filled Christian for a long time and that's what I drifted away from God. And my dad passed away last summer. And as a result of that, it brought me back um, wanting a relationship with God and rededicating my life and, and going back to church and seeking Him spiritually. And um, it was just a, and a result of that is my children um, all got back into church, my husband, you know, so that was something that was really negative the last of my father, but I really made it into something good. And it, and it has taught me that, that through you know, sad and unhappy circumstances, God is still in control, and He still has a plan. That's, that's a really good spiritual marker. Mm -hmm. that, uh, it's funny how, or interesting, how sometimes the pain in our lives is the place at which we are the closest to. I had the same spiritual marker because I was there too. Um, I didn't know my grandfather very well. I grew up with him. And the grief and the being with someone when they pass away affects your life a lot. Um, I would call that a spiritual marker because that was the first time I really thought about death and where he was going afterwards. And he was a Christian. You know, it was the first time I really had, and I'd already always believed in Jesus since I was real little and stuff, but I hadn't really had a relationship with him. And after that moment is when I really started thinking about it. And, and I believe God put that moment in my life because, in all honesty, I really had no reason to be there because I didn't know him that well, but God had a reason for me to be there. And so I was. 
And it was kind of funny because my grandfather did say when I got there that you being me, being there, is helps the most. And which was kind of weird because I didn't even, I, he didn't even really know me. But apparently he For whom it meant the most that you were Yeah. And that it helps the most for me to be there. And he didn't wow. really know me. So I don't know how I would have helped him. Apparently I did. <laughs> and I think that he knew that his passing would help me more. Me being Sometimes that those things happen. Maybe he saw something you didn't see. Part of what God was feeling and doing. Um, you know, it's interesting in our conversation this morning, uh, the circumstances that we talked about. All, all of you and the same, you know, God, I think people have circumstances whether you're a believer or not. It's just life. And you know what? People get through them. Because if you don't get through them, you die. And then you get through it anyway. <laughs> the question is, the question is, do you get through it better than when you came, when you went through it? Do you get something out of it? Do you get some refinement of your faith? And in every case that we talked about this morning, we are getting refined. Because we are we are because I think we have made a choice, it looks like. For God, you go to God with His choice, and God has allowed us to be refined and come up with a spiritual marker of a better faith. That's, and I think that's what should be happening to us. This should be going. Anybody else got any questions or anything you want to discuss? We want to get a deep on this hope and let's ask the question. If that's all true, then why sometimes does it appear that bad things happen to good people? <coughs> Have you had anyone have any experiences where maybe things didn't go your way or it seemed like bad things happened or you thought you were doing everything and living right and all this kind of stuff and crunch? Somebody died, somebody got killed, something bad happened. And how do we explain that? I asked a friend the other day because it seems like in my life there's been a lot of stuff, one thing after another, trauma, a lot of bad stuff. I asked her, I said, why does so much happen to one person or, you know, why does certain people seem to have a lot? And she said that sometimes she thinks that Satan fights the people that are going to be God's warriors the most in order to stop them. And that God allows it because those things that you learn from that, those fights, is what you're going to need later to do his work. They get wicked stronger. Yeah. And Satan's, and Satan's number one um, number one responsibility is to try to take try to take people out. But <laughs> but it's like but whenever, when you're going through a circumstance, like, like I like to refer back to this a lot. I probably will for the rest of my life when I got ran over by a truck. I have the opportunity to either, um, to either turn to God and, um, and be brought through it or, or turn away from God, become bitter, and, um, and I wouldn't have survived. And um, I mean, that's, that's a situation that we have in each and every one of our lives. We, uh, if we turn, if we turn away from God, what happens is the situation gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, and it, and it's like, and we're like, how did I get here? But if, but if we say, okay, God, I need your, I need your help. We lean more on God. Then, um, then what happens is the situation gets better and better and better and better and better. And what, what, become looks like on the surface like a horrible, a horrible circumstance ends up being something totally amazing and that you can and that many people will be reached for the kingdom of God for the rest of your life. So so how did you do that? How did you turn to God in the moment of your misery? Do you remember what you did and said and all that? Well deep down because I believe wholeheartedly that it's a um, 
is a process before. If, we've, if we're making a habit of turning our lives to God before we're facing a circumstance, then we're going to turn to God during it. But if I, if I wasn't turning to God before then, then I would become bitter and, and, um, and instead of saying, God, help me, you know, I would say, you know, I would curse the virus and boy, I can get up on that. I'm going to hurt him, you know? <laughs> so, and that would have, that would have, that would have hurt things big time. But, um, but I think the fact that, the fact that I had a, um, I had, I mean, it's, I had an, oh, I had an all right relationship with God at that time. So, I mean, he, he was enough a part of my life to know that, Without him, I could do nothing. It was it was by the grace of God that I, that I was even able to turn to him at that time. Because believe me, if, if I had my way, my first response would have been, help me, God. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying that because you had the habit of going to God, you were used to it, that it made it easier in your moment of misery to do that. Yeah, good point. And like Dr. Rader said, some people, the best counselors and the best group leaders and stuff have a passion for it. If And they help many, 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 many people out there because they have dealt with the issue themselves. If they wouldn't have gone through the issue, then all those other people wouldn't have been helped either. So sometimes bad things happen so that people can have a passion for helping others with the same problem. Yeah. And the Bible tells us in Romans 8.28 that God takes everything and works it for our good in the long term. Again, it's that big picture. Again, that we don't know. And there's a lot of things that we see as evil. I can take a number of situations in my life we don't have time to do right now. But uh, where it looked very evil, things were going in the wrong direction, it looked bad. But now looking back on it, 10 years later, I can see how it was all part of what God was putting together. And he was working it all for good. So it was really good that looked evil at the time, looking through my eyes. But through God's eyes, he knew what he was doing. And that, that we can realize that he will work everything for our good if we trust him, but we really rely on him. I also think that when we're going through those times that bad things are happening, that God helps us through our pain. You know, He just doesn't put us in that position and we suffer through it alone. I believe you can go to God and say, you know, God, I'm really hurting and I give this to you. And He will help us through that situation. And we're just about out of time, so Frank. I tell us about your experience of leading the group today and oh my goodness feedback to the rest of the people here. Uh, how do you feel? I feel I feel okay. I feel, I feel like thank you for responding. That <laughs> <laughs> took the pressure off. And, uh, yeah, I, I felt it was good. It helped to have a few questions prepared ahead of time and you know, read material and mm -hmm. have thought about it. Mm -hmm. And that obviously you guys have done the same, so thank you for your Anyone want to go on to your Sure, I'll go ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this time of fellowship that we've had. And I pray that you'll help us all to, uh, to remember the things that were, were shared in this group this week and that it'll help us through the stuff that we're going through and that we'll, that we'll always put our trust in you completely and not try to do anything in our own strength. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah.